the obvious last uh, Thursday talks, our lunchtime series for this year, which as you all know by now, started with conversations between faculty and members of our community, and almost through happy accidents ended up expanding to include colleagues outside of AUD at UCLA, and then um, outside collaborators that have um, impacted so greatly the, our work directly. So in a sense, the series is about us still at AUD and how through these uh, relationships or conversations or joint work, um, our projects keep advancing. And in this case, I'm sure you all know this, but just to kind of set the tone, uh, Michael and Kutan are partners. We've seen Michael often present the work of Yanga Nayata. And, uh, and we see how some of sort of those ideas and sensibilities translate really in everything we do, right? In Skutan, Skutan's involvement everywhere from teaching to pedagogy to the sort of the larger, uh, cultures that transpire through events in the school. So today we have the pleasure of having them in conversation. I have no idea how, what lecture like conversation like format like, but, uh, well, they are making gestures that seems like they don't know either, but I'm not sure I believe that. Uh, but very much looking forward to ending the year in this uh, very high note. So thank you both for doing this. Um, thanks. Um, it's, uh, thanks for the intro and, um, it's, Super nice to have you here, man. Uh, it's uh, kind of it's Michael's hometown. Uh, we talked about this a little bit when Brian lectured uh, mm. last week, um, and it's nice to do this uh, in person. I think we kicked off with Yara, the first one, uh, you know, two years ago uh, online, and mainly talked about kind of polemics around image. And I think maybe this is kind of a full circle uh, where we come back. Um, what we wanted to do today uh, is, I mean, obviously, um, kind of, uh, as you can see in the name, um, how, how we deal as architects through our everyday labor um, in many, many different mediums. Uh, this being one of them uh, in our circles, of course, uh, talking to one another, talking to others, uh, hearing what others have to say about the work. Uh, but we didn't always, maybe hoping to either question, question, uh, Kind of uh, irritate uh, or test new boundaries of how each medium could go beyond what we assume it consists within the disciplines and how other trajectories can be made. Um, today we have it kind of simple. Um, we thought of it more of a round table chair discussion. Um, we're going to present maybe a kind of a short. Uh, short presentation and we hope to engage all of you uh, in a conversation maybe less of a conversation uh, between us uh, perhaps more of a conversation uh, with you the work being our conversation that can work uh, in its production um, it's kind of always challenging to present work of a you know firm by two in a presentation uh, you can go a couple of different ways it's gonna start I'm gonna end uh, and uh, we'll all talk together. Uh, that's the plan. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, hello. Hey, cool. <laughs> so I guess, uh, yeah, this mic is working. There's a little bit of feedback. Hopefully there you go. it doesn't last too long. Thank you, Mariana. Thank you, Kutan. So good to see everybody. This is my hometown. I haven't lived in Los Angeles in 30 years, but now you have Kutan and you've stolen them from me. <laughs> and I have to basically, the world is leaving certain aspects of its Zoom, but our Zoom is, is, uh, is a weekly ongoing total basis because our firm now is bi-coastal and essentially run through all the mediations of uh, the digital images that we, we have to work through. Um, so, uh, this talk, or what we're going to try to do, is it's going to be less, less focused on, on explaining every single project or a, a group of projects, and more kind of about the questions of the ways in which we work through various mediums as architects. And I guess just as a little bit of a tiny preamble, we know this already. It's, it's almost just become the, this commonplace cliche where we talk about the fact that we make drawings uh, and images for buildings we don't make buildings. This, this has been repeated. Uh, uh, multiple, multiple times. But something that's actually loaded in that is the idea that somehow all of our mediums are just as transitory things that get us to the final thing, which is the building. And I think maybe what we'd like to suggest today is that we work through all these mediums as actually the locus of our labor, as actually the locus of our ideas, as actually the place in which we try to produce arguments, we try to work through experiments, 
And in all those mediums, the interesting moments are not the medium-specific uh, purity of knowing that which is only painting, that which is only drawing, that which is only models, that which is only sculpture, on and on and on, but instead the sort of promiscuity and weirdness that happens when things slip between each other. And this happens uh, all the time within architecture. And the thing that actually for us, I think, binds it to the questions of architecture are not that it must finalize itself and prove itself in the built structure of, an, of a building, but that it has something to speculate on the ways in which reality can be other than we assume it to be. That it has something tied to thoughts of the environment, thoughts of space, thoughts of the ways in which we think through uh, material, think through effects, and think through aesthetics. We're going to be saying um, quite a lot about aesthetics, both of us throughout this, so maybe it's sometimes good just to say it at the very beginning. When we say aesthetics, we, we're not talking about um, putting pretty sprinkles on top of things once you're, once you're done with the real work. We're talking about it is the real work that we do. It is the ways in which we think about how the world is available to the senses, often primarily human senses, but other things that sense and or record traces of interactions in the world. And then how do we make sense of our senses? How do we understand it? How, do the way, how are the ways in which we then begin to process and formulate arguments about the challenges and changes that uh, our sensory relationship to the world um, creates? That's enough, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, start with an image. Um, this is a photograph uh, from the photographer Thomas Ruff. Uh, we call it a photograph because Thomas Ruff calls himself a photographer, so we should think about it within that medium of photography. But this is not a photograph of an iceberg that Thomas Ruff took as a, as a human being, as an author, as an agent standing behind a camera and pressing the button that makes the sound that used to be a mechanical click and now is just telling you for your satisfaction that clicking has happened. Uh, this is a photograph that Thomas Ruff has taken from the internet, found, appropriated, made by somebody else, taken it and then blown it up extraordinarily large so that you can begin to see the pixelization of the resolution that has been compressed through the JPEG algorithm and has filtered it so that it can become an object that is disseminated, consumed, and flowing through multiple kinds of software, multiple formats of opening and closing, multiple ways of storing, and also the speed at which it can transmit over the internet. Um, this is the low-res version. This is the high-res version. Lots of action, right? Getting into the low-res, getting into the high-res. But the point being is what happens when we zoom in. Because this is the low res and this is the high res. So Thomas Ruff's photographs are actually incredibly high res versions of really, really low res information. And at that point where you're now seeing the passes of the compression algorithms, they begin to become things that suggest or allude to other kinds of artistic and or other kinds of medium, speci medium uh, speculations color field painting, the ideas of the ways in which certain uh, theories of color combinations begin to produce and, and change our registration of an edge, our relationship between field and, and uh, figure on a ground, the ways in which we begin to start to see and think spatially. Ultimately, we're starting with this image because this is our baseline uh, media today. Almost everything we do at some level will be processed through a digital screen and will be processed and compressed through an algorithm for its exchange and readability. And so whether or not we call it a drawing or whether we call it a photograph or whether we call it a painting or whether we call it a, a film, all of those things are being processed at some level at this um, scale of resolution. And it's interesting and kind of fascinating to think about it that maybe all Thomas Ruff is doing is making us aware of the ways in which these technologies are altering our image culture. But at the same time, that awareness is, not, is just a starting point. Because what makes this fascinating to Kutan and I is the kind of insane beauty of what happens when you start to now think about this in terms of a level of abstraction and how that has a very different sort of history and understanding the ways in which we can think about um, image making. So zooming into a project that Kutan and I did uh, a number of years ago, these are two images that are high zoom in uh, 
uh, renderings of flowers. Flowers that we created. Oh, here's a little bit zoomed out a little bit further. And then here's it zoomed out as a physical object in the world. So what we're looking at and thinking about and talking about in terms of these questions for this project, which we call the base flowers, were a series of flower vases. Flower vases that were 3D printed experiments about the limits of the ways in which certain multi-material 3D printing technologies could be used. And this one has a kind of, in, it's translucent plastic, which then has um, a black plastic that's embedded into the thickness of the surface to create that coral-like patterning. And the, the vase itself kind of tumbles into multiple positions, and when it tumbles into multiple positions, it can be put into different poses. Those poses can organize the flowers into different characters, different expressions, different attitudes. But we also made the flowers. And so the flowers were some version of what happens when you mash up the geological with the biological, with the technological, with uh, the floral. And these things in and of themselves were usually not the first thing that was noticed. They were noticed later. And they were noticed later, and then the reality of what they could be or what they were was in question. Because something was wrong, even though you didn't know exactly what it was, it began to become something that questioned and shifted your attention to pay, uh, different, to pay a specifically different sort of attention to the world around you. And so these images that we started with here having multiple resolutions of the medium of the digital rendering that had different levels of abstraction. So as you zoomed in again and again and again, different things would begin to appear. So actually the, thing, the model is modeled at multiple scales, some of it to look uh, like it's viscous or uh, sweaty, some of it to look very um, dry and abstract. But at, at a certain level, the ways in which those kinds of zoom ins added another kind of fictional narrative that made the flowers begin to become believable as being real in another kind of realm. Uh, there's something to it. You all have seen electron microscopes and, and whatnot. When you zoom into the world, you know, when you zoom into the world, you see these tardigrades, these, these creatures that have like gears for, for faces. Does anybody know what I'm talking about, the tardigrades? Yeah. Isn't it amazing we live in a, a world that has those kinds of things? I don't know what's going on at other planets, but I guarantee they don't have anything as weird as that. Like, that, that's, that is one of the strangest things out there. But that thing that happens, the defamiliarization that happens when you think you're getting closer and closer and closer to touch something, to gain some sort of contact to what its possible reality could be, and then it flips out and does something that you completely don't expect. Abstraction enters it in, on a, a very different level, and all of a sudden the world begins to become strange again. So another zoom in, another medium now. Here's a medium of pixels, a medium of light, uh, a medium of multiple resolutions of RGB values, uh, overlaid, superimposed on top of each other as a montage. And this is a close-up view of this image here. So there's a number of experiments that Kutan and I have been doing with photogrammetry over the past couple years. And it's good to remember that photogrammetry is, is not something that's brand new. It's something that has been with us as long as we've had photographs to calculate distance between two images to a point in space and then even back further than that in terms of perspectival surveying. But photogrammetry is essentially making a model from images and then giving it to you back as an image. So it is an image of models of images. But it's also modeling the ways in which we are starting to think about how to measure and calculate the world. More and more of our environments, and we don't need to, to you know, everyone knows this so deeply, are being essentially scanned and stored as the data of photogrammetry models. And what is done with that information, who owns it, who buys it, who sells it, how it's monetized, and the ways in which that is then uh, used to make decisions about policy, about investment, about uh, surveillance, about warfare, about uh, a number of just expanding issues. Uh, to think of them as not real is to discount the ways in which their technologies are modeling the world in alternate ways to what we think we think we are seeing when we see uh, the world available to our senses. So what is hidden where the gaps you're collecting electromagnetic information in the form of a photograph. What is outside of that range of information? What is outside of those uh, 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 frames of capture? What happens when you begin to reduce? So here's a set of 30 images. 
take out every other one, take out every third, take out every fourth. So at, at part of these questions are, this is now not just, uh, let's say, uh, a lower capture because it has been fragmented, but it is now beginning to become another kind of world. And so how can we as architects begin to explore the limits and use these technologies as design media? And how can we then use them to begin to think about architecture in alternate manners? So if I can take out every fourth image, I can change the hue, the spectrum, the saturation of every fourth image. And then I can begin to superimpose three-dimensional montages of uh, different color fields of spatial data. So. That data is there in the image. It just is not what you typically see until you drive it up uh, with our, our, you know, our, our technologies at a certain level. We're talking about Photoshop. But Photoshop now using the colored information of electromagnetic scans to three-dimensionally montage spatial fields of models to see the floor, the concrete floor of a studio in a completely different way to the point where you're beginning to think about and act on it only in the manner of a painter. Uh, this is much closer to painterly questions of color combinations, strokes, directionality of stroke, uh, issues even of composition of what happens to the corner. And then this gets us back to how does one output this into the world. This is a uh, digital image, digital image on a screen, but we've recently started screen printing. So screen printing dots of electromagnetic information as uh, dots of ink. And the changes that happens in terms of the materials of those effects uh, when you zoom in and begin to realize that the dot of ink in its color combination has a tie back to the bit of data, which is the electromagnetic light information. But in the exchanges between them, things are transformed. Uh, the colors transform, the registration of edges transform. What you think is the resolution that you're looking at begins to become finer and or rougher based on the screen that is passing the inks through it. Now, we did a, a competition for a museum for the Bauhaus a few years ago. And one of the things that we were interested in in the design of this museum was not the Bauhaus as we know it through Walter Gr Gropius and Hannes Meyer and its sort of architectural uh, problems that have, have kind of been bequeathed to us over a century of influence, but that the place was really weird. And the experiments that were going on with textiles, with photography, with color theory, with um, performance art, uh, this was kind of the multimedium freakout of what was happening with the pedagogy and the experiment of the Bauhaus as a collective for trying to understand and study new technologies, new theories of uh, aesthetics, and new ways in which those can influence and become part of the modern world. So at every level, our proposal for the Bauhaus was a kind of uh, medium bash, where we were working on here uh, these vessels, these vessels in terms of their articulation, their articulation are little tiny glass tiles, but the colorations are meant at some levels to begin to act like textiles at other levels, begin to act as if they were fired vessels fired in a kiln, um, how they then related to uh, the collectivity of a group, the assembly of, of multiple elements, all of them are the same, they're just rotated and intersected and cut at different levels, and how that could become a kind of collective aggregation of ideas, of forms, of masses, of spaces, how it would sit into a park so that you could walk underneath it from any direction, uh, elevated up to the kind of datum of the floor behind, and then to the ways in which we started to image it. Uh, the images that we're often producing we can think about them within histories of perspective and photography, but I think we'd, Kutan and I would probably think that we're closer to just what happens with the world of montage. Because the construction of these images is the artificial placement, like a still life, of things into relationships with each other, much more so than any sort of single captured view of, of, a, of a world out there. So the photographers that come out of the Dusseldorf school, um, this photograph from, from Sasse, none of these things ever existed together in that space. Each of them is photomontage next to the one that's above it, yet its elevational material reality begins to suggest certain sets of combinations that are, well, that are, are 
in excess of what its assembly is. It's, it's concealing its assembly to begin to produce a speculation about what that world could be like, behave like, look like. So our Bauhaus Museum, or well, everything's going on automatic timer now. All right, we'll see if it stops. So this cluster of objects uh, is sitting across the diagonal to the corner of, of the city. Uh, flower beds of, of colored gardens as it hits the, hits the ground, and then this continuous plan, almost intestinal uh, movement on, on the interior of a single floor which collects and connects all of these vessels together. Uh, towards the bottom half is the, the permanent collection, and towards the top half is a temporary uh, changing um, exhibition space. But the, the project is, in many ways, essentially one piece which is collected into one floor, which operates on the outside as many clustered, huddled together objects or vessels, but ultimately in plan, it's just circles on a grid. And that's it. Just circles on a grid that when they're intersected, become a completely different world on the interior. So one of these things that we're constantly trying to investigate, uh, which falls under, un under terms like poche, is the difference and or tension between an interior spatial idea and an exterior building form, building figure, building mass. And that those two things are related but are never the same thing. And the ways in which you can present an architecture that you think you know what you're going to get from the outside, but upon entering and upon moving and upon experiencing those spaces, radically challenges the sensations one had predicted that you would have. And this ties back to the medium uh, for us as photography, because there's an issue that photography could be a record of the past, an index of those things which have existed, then recorded and in, 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 encased with um, the chemical reactions uh, that light has produced on the film. But the other thing that photography does quite often, it is, is presenting images that are modeling our expectations for the things we believe we will experience next. So it's actually projecting also into the future. It, uh, photography does everything about trying to push what we think will happen. And if you can subvert that, bring in attention, question the assumptions about what that world may look like, uh, then I think you're into some really interesting aesthetic territory via the speculations of architecture. I think this is a handoff point, right? This is a handoff point. Switch seats, I think. Switch seats. The computer doesn't work. People move. People move. All right, cool. Um, one of the things I learned practicing with Michael is uh, I need to slow down after he speaks. Um, as, uh, I, I think that will balance that. <laughs> um, speaking of Poche and um, photography uh, simultaneously and moving into the, um, I, I guess into the kind of uh, medium of building, building itself um, and um, looking at the building and documenting through its um, physicality, reality, through its own mediums, um, it, as to kind of discover things that you don't necessarily um, either imagine, think, uh, be able to visualize, uh, but use the tool as a way to open up uh, other ways of reading uh, a project in some way, uh, referring back to Michael was just saying in terms of the projective capacity of uh, how uh, photography could uh, set up other uh, potentials about uh, the reality of the work. Um, this is our project uh, in Mexico City, uh, uh, the residential project. Uh, I have talked about this um, uh, you know, a couple of times. So I'm going to really keep it to uh, this question of Poche, this question that begins to produce a tension between outside and inside, uh, the ambiguity of uh, how we understand Poche through the materiality of uh, either the glass, something as thin as, uh, you know, half an inch uh, that doesn't really kind of exist to our eyes necessarily, something that we can look through, see through, outside to inside to outside again uh, and begin to capture other forms of reflection onto it um, beginning to produce kind of more ambiguous definition of uh, what the thickness uh, of this uh, skin might be 
um, step away uh, from the medium uh, as one disappears, um, you know, um, the other ones that are backlit begins to get solidified, uh, further pushing into tension between um, what the specificity of the medium of glass does for the project, depending on uh, how it operates uh, in the light environment, uh, appearing as a standalone building, putting into some kind of tension in terms of what is a window uh, and what's an aperture uh, within the building. I think um, that is to say, um, looking at the same window uh, from outside producing uh, a kind of inaccessible depth uh, within the monolith uh, that then completely disappears. Not necessarily articulating a huge thickness that would give us a sensation in terms of uh, what the outside does, what the outside feels like, what our perception is from outside versus the inside. Um, but uh, that is only regulated uh, within that minimal thickness uh, reducing right our reading of this uh, immense depth uh, as the darkened glass plays a different trick on the eye uh, versus the disappearance of it uh, through the backlit condition. Um, the other kind of uh, quality of uh, changing thickness uh, is of course uh, the articulation of the concrete that oscillates between uh, razor edge articulation of that small window uh, that completely uh, begins to layer the kind of concrete on top of uh, on top of itself, uh, seen from out from uh, both sides, resulting in uh, a window that is at once trapezoidal uh, at at you know at the other vantage point, begin to um, produce a f you know uh, for shortening and resulting in a completely different geometric. Uh, reading, but the the thickness of the bu building, uh, what we might understand traditionally as kind of the mass that defines, uh, um, is kind of an oscillation in terms of how you move around it, but not only how you move uh, in and uh, in and out of the building. It begins to perform uh, slightly differently uh, when you begin to kind of look up the building. Um, the thickening of the slab itself uh, by the uh, ruled surfaces that move in and out to uh, make the windows available um, and the uh, kind of curving walls. Uh, it leaves itself kind of questionable in terms of trying to decipher uh, at first glance uh, how thick, how massive, uh, and how um, kind of accessible and accessible um, uh, it might be from uh, from outside. Um, one of the kind of uh, qualities that uh, I think we came to kind of learn about the building, uh, and that's really through kind of seeing it, uh, through photographing it, is this, uh, is this really quality of uh, how we understand Poche as a shift in experience, spatial experience, and uh, in addition to how we understand the aura of the architectural object as uh, as we move from outside to inside, but also as kind of the environmental effects uh, that begin to uh, um, kind of influence the object itself as it moves through the day, what is kind of uh, hard and inaccessible and heavy through the articulation of that thickness. Um, kind of moves into a much softer domain of materiality where concrete is no longer as harsh as it seems during day daylight and uh, kind of the black light begins to soften up um, you know with the light from behind and the building acquires a kind of accessibility and transparency that uh, you did not kind of expect perhaps uh, when you first encountered it. Um, moving from uh, kind of maybe material qualities that shift within a project, uh, shifting to questions about how material properties could be imagined differently um, in the life cycle of a project um, as a speculative act. Um, we were uh, invited uh, um, to MoMA's program in Istanbul uh, to compete to co for the competition to design the um, the courtyard installation in the Istanbul Modern Museum. And um, those of you are familiar, uh, the later mandate of this competition, um, you know, uh, having started with experimental approaches to fabrication, uh, kind of cutting edge design, etc., cetera, uh, into the territory of uh, how we responsibly imagine this pavilion, uh, what happens to the afterlife, all the materials, 
uh, that are used uh, and um, kind of seeing it more of a conventional and ethical means of uh, material transformation, um, you know, that uh, we execute. Um, we wanted to kind of take this question and the, um, you know, medium specificity of uh, construction materials uh, in a slightly different directions, um, kind of engaging uh, absolutely politically incorrect materials from PVC hoses to plastic zip ties uh, to rebar uh, to some concrete to help us uh, ground these uh, as well as uh, little pebbles. Uh, setting these as a material um, kind of pellet, begin to imagine a project uh, that could have an afterlife that didn't rely on how responsibly these projects kind of disappeared from our cognition uh, and became uh, um, kind of either reusable, uh, reimaginable um, kind of other acts. Uh, but we really wanted to imagine them to have a kind of a life of permanence, uh, perhaps outside of the realm of uh, human perception. Um, but uh, the construct was uh, very simple. Uh, rebars uh, shaped uh, in an umbrella-like uh, profile uh, cast into the uh, steel casing, which then got sleeved with um, PVC hoses that drooped uh, down, demarcated on the ground at various scales, begin to kind of couple up towards one another um, and then smaller sleeves uh, kind of completing what might one call canopy, umbrella, um, like semi-pavilion, uh, uh, maybe other things, uh, and then receive the zip ties as things that would flicker in the wind uh, and um, kind of not really provide shadow, uh, but perhaps kind of uh, effects of movement uh, if you were to kind of uh, inhabit uh, underneath them um, in the kind of Bosphorus uh, wind in Istanbul. Um, the kind of uh, thinking with the project was uh, we could uh, use this as spaces to um, kind of uh, sit around, get around, um, using the loops on the ground as ways to kind of really um, uh, Leave it indeterminate in the way uh, how it might, how people might in a, in a, uh, appropriate it uh, in any given layout. But of course, uh, kind of you know, apart from what it would do for two months uh, in the museum uh, courtyard, uh, the future of uh, the material itself uh, was really the larger question that we were interested in. Um, we kind of looked at things, what happens after they die, what happens after uh, they no longer serve the purpose they do, and uh, what other purpose uh, they can help to uh, kind of, uh, what other purpose can we imagine them uh, have uh, in their future. So we literally took this uh, as a direct act uh, and completely uh, turned it upside down. Um, what was held down uh, by gravity uh, was now uh, being uh, pushed out uh, uh, with the Beyoncé of water. Uh, we're basically suggesting uh, take the entire thing, turn it upside down, and place it at the bottom of the ocean, uh, which is basically the um, kind of uh, lower level of the site. Uh, the site itself is an artificial floating deck uh, next to the museum building. Um, and this way, in some way, the project would live uh, as long as the material would uh, uh, durably uh, uh, kind of exist uh, under the water, uh, away from human perception, uh, making habitats for uh, non-human within the aquatic uh, kind of environment, almost live as a phantom, uh, maybe with the knowledge of it's there, but we don't quite know uh, what it does. Um, for us, it was kind of interesting, the, uh, the qualities uh, that the materials mediated in the initial uh, competition uh, uh, stage where it was all about kind of drooping, feeling the gravity of the things, etc., were completely reversed in their performance in the underworld where uh, they began to uh, perhaps uh, be a scaffolding for further life to happen. Now, um, those of you familiar with this uh, 
uh, project, you're asked to do animation, an animation that uh, mostly falls into the tropes of uh, flight throughs where you move through your design, show them how it looks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, for us, we kind of contemplating about the future reality of this pavilion uh, compel us to kind of really look into uh, kind of uh, media, um, almost perhaps uh, YouTube, uh, internet news, uh, things that we could kind of pull in into the project to present it in alternative manners in the way it infiltrates the culture, uh, whether um, um, in its place of origin or other places um, as the kind of uh, future of the project uh, disseminates into the world of uh, internet. Um, I'm going to play that uh, film now and uh, that will be the end of uh, what we got for you. I want to talk to you today about fish habitat. I'm standing in front of an eight acre lake in the past 20 years, lots of different types of structure have been added to the lake, whether it be pallets or brush, old Christmas trees. After many years of field trials, we've developed a much better and more permanent solution to enhancing your fish habitat with our honey hole trees and shrubs. Now the body and limbs are made from polyethylene, which is flexible, lightweight, and will not rot or deteriorate. Each unit gives you a very dense structure with lots of surface area without the snagging problems that you typically have with your traditional types of cover. Now there's several important reasons to add structure to your pond or lake. And one is to give your mature fish like your bass and crappie a place to ambush prey. These predators are going to feed more effectively and have much better growth rates if they can use cover to find their food. Now, our honey hole tree was designed to be used in water depths of six foot or more. And typically you're going to want to add all your structure in the top 10 to 15 foot of the lake because that's where your fish are most of the time. We'll place 12 shrubs and nine trees per acre, typically in groups of two to three. Adding structure has to be part of your management plan. ในรายการกลางนะคะฝนมาเรียงงานตัวละค่ะพร้อมจัดเต็มทั้งบันเทิงไทยบันเทิงต่างประเทศให้คุณผู้ชมได้ดูก่อนรู้ก่อนที่น
Um, I think, um, you know, what we wanted to uh, kind of cover today a little bit is um, kind of the range of daily labor um, one can potentially engage. Um, like in some way, we're, we're architects interested in building. Um, and, you know, at, at the end of the day, that's always there. Um, but at some level, I think most of our conversations around uh, is generation of ideas through the things that we immediately engage, um, you know, um, in our computers, on our desks, uh, through our pencils, through our conversations, and through engagements like this. Um, and that is to say, perhaps, um, there is no one way of practicing. Um, and there are many different ways of practicing architecture. I think this is especially important um, for a graduating class to maybe recognize, set in their sights as they think about what is it that we're going to do. Um, and I think, um, you know, one, one thing I would love to kind of conversate today with uh, everyone is the kind of richness and broad breadth of the possibilities how one can practice and how kind of different questions can be engaged around questions of uh, making architecture. Um, but Sound cool? I mean, the, obviously, the spirit of this layout is uh, for anyone to jump in and um, just um, just continue the conversation. Uh, I can start. Sure. So, starting off with Tomas Roof's work and invoking the Becker School and Dusseldorf School, um, those photographers, those photographers, historically have never written uh, a text, hardly ever granted an interview, and more or less never spoke about their work. So in a way, when I think about the context of architecture school where we're not allowed to do that, we're just simply not allowed to show up and go, there it is. Education or giving a lecture so that's a form of labor, obviously. Um, the magician pulling the curtain back and going, here's how I did it and so forth. Could you imagine not talking about software? Could you, not, could you imagine not talking about techniques and essentially, as you did, disclose ways in which you produced the work? I know that was about trying to say that the ideas are looping back and forth through the techniques. Not to say that if Photoshop or Adobe didn't exist, you wouldn't have any ideas. Michael's an electric guitar player, and when that was invented, you could make different forms that you couldn't before. So we all understand technology. Um, it, so if I'm in your position, I'm scratching my head going, do I, do I make this preamble this way as a setup? And does it disclose, or is it meant to make arguments? Because at times I could hear it as an argument, or quite honestly, I could say, I don't care about Photoshop. I don't care about filters or tools or anything. Tell me the idea. But they're, they're little cells of ideas that are looping back and forth, so I can see the kind of meta presence. But that must be something for you guys to ponder, right? Sure. This issue of technique as content mm -hmm. and what it means. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the question. I mean, it's, there is a very interesting, there's, there's a very interesting way in which we as, uh, as a discipline, try to formulate and produce arguments to explicate what it is that we're up to. And we don't always do a very good job of it. Uh, uh, this is not to, to somehow you know, critique all of, all of the ways in which we, we stumble and attempt to use language and words to sometimes speak to things that are well in excess of anything that a language could actually uh, 
accomplished in terms of its communication. Yet it's necessary, and I think both Kutan and I believe in discourse uh, as, an, as an immensely important part of what, what an architect practices, not only because we're, we have to teach, and teaching requires a certain sort of struggle and effort to communicate clearly the ideas and the arguments of an architecture, um, and how that then relates to, for us, to kind of bounce back and forth between explicating certain aspects, the raising of awareness in a critical project is often that which exposes the techniques and the tools that we use and share, the conventions. Tools, techniques, conventions establish a certain set of terms upon which we can agree and evaluate when work is different, when work is the same, when it's uh, challenging a certain border or boundary or when it's pushing uh, comfortably within it. And so it's necessary to talk about it sometimes, but I, I think we would, we would both hope that those discussions are not the justification for the work. That the questions of, of the aesthetic qualities or the ways in which those aesthetic experiences that you have of the different mediums, um, that's always more important to us than the raising of awareness through the exposure of a tool or a technique. Those are kind of, it's, it's necessary, you have to start with it, you have to be clear about it, but if it ends there, then you end with a discipline that's in tatters and lying as detritus on the floor, and ultimately we're very hopeful people. Uh, we hope that the world can be other than, than we've, we had, we've received it, and so there's always this sort of necessary leap into the speculative, the projective, the the ways in which it creates and or alters our engagement with it. Uh, you know, whether or not a lecture and its discourse should only focus on one or the other, um, I think there's been times when it's really been interesting to see people always unpacking process and always unpacking the techniques they're using. And there's also been really interesting to have times when all of that is, is hidden, it is not discussed at all, and the only thing that is on the table are uh, concepts and aesthetics. Um, I think as teachers we have to be able to go back and forth between both. Yeah, I mean, uh, just to dovetail that, you know, we, I, I think very early on we kind of recognize we cannot chase evolving uh, digital technology. Um, like, we're never going to be as good as what we were, let's say, uh, late 2000, 2000s, um, and we'll be out of touch very soon. Um, and I think um, you know, our interest shifted from um, trying to master what comes next to trying to conceptualize uh, what comes, look at it, trying to understand it, maybe get uh, more of a general knowledge of how it operates so we could have a conversation around uh, how it could be um, kind of subverted, perhaps, uh, as a tool, uh, as a technology. Um, I think we're at an arm's length to um, kind of uh, having a technology of any of our things uh, express themselves explicitly in the work. Uh, I think in the context of today, um, you know, us going into certain things of how it's made, et cetera, et cetera. I think it's more for the context of this conversation, I would say. But hopefully uh, how it's made uh, doesn't really affect uh, both in terms of technique and technology, in terms of what the outcomes are. U ultimately, I think there are a different set of uh, ambitions. Uh, one with dealing with everyday labor, one perhaps deals with um, like the permanence or life of the thing that comes out uh, and that deals with different set of questions uh, in the world, depending on its context, et cetera, et cetera. Carrying, of course, uh, you know, uh, a kind of idea itself uh, towards its future, but that's perhaps not privileging neither technology or uh, nor its technique. I can't remember which one, but earlier today made a statement that was sounded definitive um, um, to the effect that the building, at the end of the day, a constructed building is the is the object of the game. 
and clearly with some of the work at least, that's the case. I'm wondering though, it, it's so easy to see in a lot of your work, the possibility that the image is the end game mm -hmm. somehow. I, I wonder if you would speak to that. It, 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 am I correct that you have some projects that are one and other projects that would be the other? And if so, when image is the end game, and I'm, I'm asking for myself because it's a, kind of uh, a primary question on my mind for years now, but I'm also asking, hoping to engage the graduate student class because when it, when you think about, you know, what am I going to be able to do in the world when I graduate in the next few years, let's say, um, having fully constructed buildings in the real world. Is a, is a bit of a stretch for most of us. It certainly was for me as a you know when I first graduated. Um, whereas putting out images as as kind of the end result, if those are provocative and engaging and actually moving something, doing something, um, that's the kind of office project, if you will, that you could imagine making a difference, even right out of school, depending sure. on. So I'm wondering if, if you would speak to that side of the work. Um, I mean, I think especially with Mexico Project, um, I got mine. Uh, <laughs> and it kind of makes funny noises. Um, I think especially with the Mexico Project, um, we work with a photographer, um, that, you know, wonderful images. And we found ourselves um, kind of always um, um, wondering, like, um, how, how can the imaging of actually a building can go on as a project within the life of itself, you know? Um, like, okay, the building is there, but there's so much more to tease out in the way it could be reimagined as a continuous project. And I think for uh, quite a few of our projects that life goes on that way. Um, there's an after project for the Bauhaus uh, uh, Museum that's written as a parafictional uh, uh, piece for its future. Uh, however, it died in the competition. It had kind of a, a life of its own. Uh, how we kind of uh, think about seeing the building in ways that we're not really seeing through conventional architectural photography is a way we've been thinking about Mexico. And as a speculative act, building worlds, um, if you're not building actual things, is definitely what we've been doing. Um, you know, in so many ways. Um, I think ma I don't want to be misunderstood that the main objection is the building. Yeah. Uh, I think what Michael said was that is kind of the general understanding, but our everyday labor is about producing representation. And um, for us, I think, yes, we're architects, we'd love to build at the end of the building. A at the end of the day, buildings, sure. Um, but I think um, for us, the playing field of the kind of media we engage is much broader. Um, and I don't think one is above the other, at least in our kind of intellectual inquiry of uh, what we feel about what we do, um, like only building or only drawing or this. I think it's all moving through one another. And, you know, frankly, um, things outside of building are much uh, closer and immediate uh, in the way we can influence and engage that probably more productive. I mean, it's such a complex enterprise to build anything, uh, mm. as any architect can do. Yeah, I would just say, yeah, the images for many of the projects are the projects. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and and to, to Kutan's point, so many of these things are about afterlifes. Uh, the, the, the images we started with, the, the zoomed in renderings of the surfaces of the flowers were done for an exhibition in Paris that was uh, well after the initial exhibition in, in Chicago. So they were done years afterwards. The, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the question we were just talking about too with uh, the Istanbul Modern, what happens to the project after the project's built in and done? The actual project is, actu the project is more real because of the imaging of the film after something would have been dismantled. That that actually begins to become its, its reality is, is, is in the mediation of, of how it extends its life after it's gone. And we can think about this in architecture all the time, how many buildings have been torn down, but they have huge influences over us and, and the ways in which we understand them through, through, images. through drawings and photographs. And, uh, 
And I think that that's, I, I guess my opening statement was just to, to, to try to say, if we only think of the drawing of the image as something that leads to and is validated by the final construction, that diminishes the importance of what those images actually are. And, and that at a certain level, I think we're trying to find ways in which, ways in which we practice through, through the constant sort of overflow and overlap of, of different media. And whether or not it ends in a finished physical building is, um, is a continual question, but not one that legitimizes the image itself, if that makes sense. Maybe that's better. Is that hopefully a little clearer? I don't know. Let's see. Um, my question is basically, I've been extremely interested in, in image making myself, I'm in Kutan studio right now, and the question of um, who, would the, who would the image be for once I make this image after graduate school? Right now it's very clear, I have you as my audience, I have my, my classmates as my audience, but once I leave, and I'm certainly probably for five years, if I choose to not go into academia, then I, who would I, who would it even interest? And can I only be in academia if I'm interested in image making? Or is there at some point going to be a change where practice engages that as a monetary value as well that isn't just speculation? Uh, there's, like, there's a way in which to, to look at social media as the endless, infinite scrolling stream of labor being done by all of us for the 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 financial success of an institution out there that is totally and completely exploiting um, our work, in that, that that it's ultimately totally meaningless. But then there's another thing, and I think we've all had this happen, where all of a sudden there are certain images you see, and they become specific active, interventive uh, challenges to the ways in which you think about either your own work or certain sort of uh, uh, aesthetic questions, and then you're pulled in and you find that there's another constituency, another group of people that maybe actually you are part of as an audience, but then you become participant in creating work that that builds these micro constituencies and groups of people and and there's and and this is the thing. So it's like there's so many things that are problematic about social media, but then there are these moments where you're all of a sudden connected to certain things that you probably would have never been connected to in another way. And they're very real. And they they have massive impacts on on people's lives. Uh, so part of what your audience is, and this is, we're talking about social media now just because it is the ways in which um, all of us are involved at some level, but I think that the moment you graduate, the, the question of who's your audience is a, is a really kind of great and important architectural project. Uh, that you actually, I think maybe most of us, and maybe you know, looking at Neil here, uh, build an audience through the speculations on representations prior to the construction of those buildings. And that those reinventions begin to gather conversations around how that can be then um, actualized in different manners. And then sometimes in the case of, I don't know, maybe someone like, like Levius Woods, it's actualized in the imaginations of, of us as a, as a, as a, as a collective, collective world. And um, and doesn't necessitate actually that it that it be somehow proved by built. It's proved by building in our minds, and I would say at some level. Yeah, I mean the kind of the range of image, right? Like what who who it can reach in the multitudes. Like this building, nine families might live there, um, but. You know, depending on where it gets posted, it's either seen by thousands, sometimes three people. Um, like, you know, like you can never know, you can never gauge. But in some way, there is a um, kind of pursuit of a project that's, you know, like for an audience that uh, reads it differently, and then there are other audiences that uh, appreciate it other ways. I think, like, like this guy uh, who, who talks about the project, um, I found him online. 
um, and he explained the project better than we could, right? And he speaks not to us, he speaks to a kind of material reality, uh, a kind of crazy tactic of like, you know, like r raising fish and catching, and then releasing, catching, releasing, just to make the kind of habitat that, uh, that he can regulate, right? Um, and all we had to do is figure out, okay, if this is kind of uh, our megaphone into the world, um, how do we enter the background of that conversation, right? So I think depends how you choose to kind of uh, speak to the world, depends on the strategy. Um, and you need to kind of make your own audience. Like that, that's for me kind of the bigger thing. Like it's as broad as you want it, it's as narrow as you want it. And that's kind of a matter of choice in terms of how you push forward. I have a half-baked thought, but I never saw your project in this way, so I wanted to ask about repetition. Um, and first I thought, well, the theme that you set up for the talk had nothing to do with that. It was about sort of images and the visual, but also technology and medium. And then I thought, well, in art, repetition has been sort of present throughout its history definitely identifiable in the 20th century. But when it comes to architecture, I think under the influence of computation, repetition definitely took on a turn. And today in the three projects that you showed on the second part of the talk, but I would say maybe also in the flowers, I mean, I, today for some reason I just thought repetition is everywhere, either through the same unit that proliferates or repetition through a form of seriality, right? Repetition and difference. Um, but I never heard you talk about the work that way. And I don't know if this is a thing or not a thing. That's why it's a half-made thought. But today, I just could not not see it everywhere, from the initial image of the pixelation to th that reduction somehow revealing something that was not visible before that I think you explained beautifully, but could also could have been explained by questions of repetition and variation or seriality and how we operate there. So is that a thing in the work or do you talk about repetition? Good thing we took the other project out. <laughs> <laughs> no, more. <laughs> that would have been more explicit. Um, Maybe we don't talk about it because, uh, I mean, it's definitely in the work and I think it's been in a couple of these projects. They're not chronological, uh, they're not also uh, maybe more recent, um, but they do operate through that trope. Uh, but perhaps we see it more as a technique of uh, making something and in the conversation uh, that, you know, um, at least in the projects that never comes uh, to the foreground. Um, but I would say, I think, in the way uh, it operates, um, at least Bauhaus and, uh, and this one, um, like trying to move away from a form of, from a strategy of form making that relies on uh, gestural holes, um, to really break down the hole, really work with uh, local compositions that begin to build up uh, the hole, um, trying to kind of move away from, you know, um, kind of signaler readings of tectonics uh, to potential uh, open-ended interpretations. Um, I think uh, the kind of coupling, uh, fusing, etc. you begin to see in um, Bauhaus that begins to deviate as you move around. It doesn't repeat itself, even though its uh, features are there, its character is there as a kind of uh, modulation and repetition of parts. Uh, they behave differently locally, both in terms of material uh, kind of uh, boundaries between them or how they fuse and what n many numbers they fuse, etc. I wouldn't say it hopefully, you know, falls apart, falls away from any parametric uh, tropes uh, in terms of rules and regulation uh, generating reality, but it's been a tactic for us to overcome, I would say, our early uh, projects where we were like, like singular in form making. It was kind of an attempt to move away from it, but not within the um, tropes of, let's say, you know, the kind of tools where you, you know what I'm talking about, parameters, et cetera. But 
Hmm. Yeah, repetition. Maybe we could redo the lecture <laughs> on the question of on the question of seriality, representation, and, and the distancing of authorship um, by the release of form making to to system thinking. But um, yeah. Oh. kind of nonlinear derive as well. That there is a, I mean this, thank you so much for the talk, that was great. A lot to think about and through, uh, and we sort of see what you're up to. I'd like to maybe hear m more explicitly about what you're into uh, uh, in terms of the preferences and defaults, right? I would say repetition would be a kind of a default, but also, I sense, let's say, the tension between the f fauvism and impressionism. I see uh, Morandi-like defaults, an interest in entropy, decadence, like Baudelarian degradation. So is that, and none of this is pejorative, it's just me reg registering stylistic ticks and, yeah. and, and affects, is, is that, is it, and then the project of radical amazement slash radical conf confoundment, if that's a word. Um, could you talk a little bit about what what you're into? Yeah, sure. That, no, that, that's cool. And and, <laughs> and th those those lists, that list of allusions and, and suggestions, um, are kind of spot on. Uh, so, like, f for instance, with this, I think we've been reading a lot and talking about photography between us, but also, um, like, like the stuff going on with the, the the series we're titling "Spectral Montages." So, part of that was like, all right, so what the hell do we do with with photogrammetry? Because um, what it essentially presents is a world that is uh, modeled after images that then produces images. And so that exchange between uh, images of models of images became interesting to us, and, and photography as as not a document of the past, but as an analogical parallel reality, so that the photogrammetry model becomes a parallel reality to the reality that we assume is that which is around us, but never confute to never fall into the slip that one is exactly the other, but that they both have equal possibilities. So then, for us as architects who who have developed all of these, these techniques for controlling form via line. Uh, either line as bounding contour or edge or the meeting of the intersection of two surfaces or then line as the regulator through cuts. It all kind of falls apart with photogrammetry because there's no more edges. It's just uh, marks in a matrix, which is a painterly problem of, of just collections of electromagnetic dots. and. How do you work with that? Which point would you move first? Which one would you move second? You, you have 170 million of them, and, and you can go through them like one by one, but they're not going to get very far. So, so these, these questions of uh, the fraying of edges, the degradation of surfaces, the, the, the detritus that begins to become refuse as a kind of uh, sort of almost celebration of, of uh, uh, the ways in which things fall apart. Yeah. That it's no longer about getting the tight photogram photogrammetry model, but the landscape, almost like, like the kind of geological, hydrological movements of, of tones of optical vibrations that move across surfaces. And, and is there something in that that would allow us as architects to think through those aesthetic questions towards other ways in which they would impact and change our space making? Uh, Imagination. Um, you are drawn to that fire. Yeah. yeah. That you're mesmerized. Without a doubt. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, we we taught a workshop um, last January, um, and it was interesting. I, I think I came to the realization at the end, like you cannot really teach uh, to design through photogrammetry in the ways we teach architecture. Like it, it's just not possible. Um, it, it, like our understanding of how we make enclosure, how we make seriality, how, how we control certain things as we um, as we design, um, just doesn't operate. And 
Like, I, I, I don't know, like, where it goes, but it's kind of an open-end question. Like, uh, how do we find ourselves engaged this moment um, and see if we can make, uh, you know, something productive out of that uh, as a generative tool? Um, you know, it makes me kind of, uh, back to my conversation with Yara two years ago, I think, you know, that was on the table. Like, how does this become kind of a generative tool? How do we engage it disciplinarily in a... Uh, projective manner, and so it moves away from re-registering the world, um, um, you know, in a, in a different way only, but moves beyond. Um, and it challenges, I think, our conventions in terms of not only how we try to teach it, but also like how we conceptualize this uh, this new kind of assembly. So this is why I think I'm curious that the program you showed like different images. We're moving images. We have photography. We have all of these different types. And then when you get to photogrammetry, it's actually the only one that is spatial, right? Like photogrammetry in its nature is defined by these dots. And what's interesting about them is that not only they hold color value, but they also hold depth, right? So they actually exist in 3D space. And then the result from that is an image you flatten. And I would argue it's maybe the flattest image in your presentation. So I find it a bit peculiar that a medium that is three-dimensional it becomes the most flat thing you have when actually the data, and then the way you transform it, right, was changing colors of different images and hues, so the result gets more colorized, uh, but that means that you're losing the contrast, so you're taking away from the legibility of its spatial qualities. So I find it curious, and I wanted to ask you if you could talk a bit more, why flattening something that is three-dimensional and that I think is interesting three-dimensional because it could enter the domain of architecture as an image that is spatial, which I think has an immense potential. Um, so yeah, I just find it a bit peculiar and wondered if you wanted to talk about it. Yeah, sure. Uh, um, so I think that, first of all, so the, the three-dimensionality of the points that are located in an XYZ space and given a specific RGB color value, it's an interesting kind of three-dimensionality because it's a three-dimensionality without thickness. Yeah. It's, it's a fully three-dimensional, non-dimensional reality, yeah. right? Because it has no thickness at all, so but it's fully three-dimensional. And like once you start to smoke that for a little bit, <laughs> uh, that's when you're, you're getting like, oh, what am I, wait a second here. There's no thickness, but it's fully three-dimensional. Um, and there's no surface. And there's no surface. So it's not a surface. No. There's no line. There's, there's no only line. points, and that's it. Um, and so I think that what, and, and I think we're working through it. I think this is the, the, the point maybe for us, and we're not, we're in the midst of it, is is asking the questions conceptually and asking the questions aesthetically of what how we how we begin to manipulate these things. So we know what it what it can be in terms of then being the kind of uh, skeletal armature for triangulations for meshes that can then I mean Google Earth we tool around with all the time. Um, but let's say let's just hold that off and just say all right. So we're not going to mesh it. We're not going to triangulate it. We're not going to treat them as surfaces. We're just going to treat it as points. How can we work with those points? And so then the questions of filtering thresholds, of m manipulating large uh, bodies of points within specific ranges. So the hue and color value and saturation things, it's finding latent colors that are in the light of, of the floor um, because there's artificial light and natural light that are mixing in different places. And then extracting out that, driving it up, and then beginning to mix them in terms of almost, it is somewhere between favism and, and, and impressionism. At some point, it's pointillism too. But uh, how does color combinations begin to register possible spatial figures, forms, and grounds that are not the actual three-dimensional points in space that are in the photogrammetry model? So the spatiality is, is much more the optical suggestion of depth that is given through perception than it is the physical depth of measurement in space. Now, the hope is then, as, as we as architects have done many times throughout our, our lives, is we've misread other art forms and 
and interpreted them to do things that, that are not actually legitimately within the, the terms that that art form was setting forward. But they've, we've created some, as a discipline architecture, not us personally, some amazing ideas about space from those misreadings. Uh, so we're in the midst, right? But when it gets fully three-dimensional, I think the point for us was just that it, it wouldn't necessarily necessitate that it is the three-dimensionality of the points in the initial calculation, but that there was something else afoot. If that makes sense, yeah? Yeah, it does. Because I thought when you first uh, saw the photograph was low resolution, and when you zoom in, you actually see more resolution because it's defined through these cubes. Mm -hmm. And I thought you were contrasting that with photogrammetry because when you zoom in, you only see a point, right? Yeah. So it's like impre uh, yeah. impressionism. Yeah. for uh, the way I see it, because the closer you get, the less you understand, right? Yeah. Which, where That's is the, yeah, the, the more, the closer you get, the more abstract Yeah, which gets. is like the opposite yeah. of the When you're really far away, it looks like high-level realism, and, and the closer you get, it evaporates, it's Zeno. Like, you're never gonna get there. It's just, yeah. just uh, step by step. It keeps disappearing. Right? Yeah. yeah. See, like you you try to get to it, and it goes away. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess maybe, just to put a term on it, like, um, does the output becomes um, kind of a representation of a simulation, um, or it becomes kind of representation of um, the reality of the unseen? Um, and I think um, kind of uh, through the filters, what we're trying to tease out maybe things that we can't necessarily just design, uh, but the emergence of those layers as a potential to kind of govern what gets projected uh, as a flat thing, you know. I, I think um, if you think within the conventions of um, how we work 3D models and what our outputs are, right, we either uh, flatten them or um, like treat them as though they're three-dimensional. In some way, we're dealing with a media. Um, I think we're dealing with that convention in terms of, you know, um, they're photogrammetry images, but they present themselves as kind of painterly artifacts. So um, I think the combination of painting in terms of how it comes as a projection, how it comes as a surface, uh, is kind of important in the output of, uh, of those images. Thank you. And by the way, I remember the workshop from years ago at the, at the Städelschule, and and you actually asked a question at the end of it, what if we just left it at points? So <laughs> this is your problem, right? <laughs> he does, he <laughs> does not forget. We <laughs> just left it at points because Yara told us to. And, yeah, and so. That's what she said to uh, Thank you so much for this wonderful talk and event yeah. and questions. What a pleasure again. Hey, awesome. thank you guys for having us. Thank you for having us.